கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Sri Ramana Bhagavan had an intense and abiding bhakti towards Arunachala hill and here we see a drawing in his own hand with a shloka written underneath and this shloka is known as Arunachala Shiva Dhyanam in other words it's a verse for contemplating the reality of arunachala as a form of shiva so you heard it a minute ago in the introduction so let's go over the meaning real quick here karuna arnava naik means being an ocean of grace who is implied karuda gati nalgun bestows liberation when thought of aruna chala shivam idam behold this is aruna chala shiva now let's look at the synonyms of each word karunai means grace or compassion arnavam means ocean aik means being karudak means when thought of and gati means liberation moksha nalgu means who bestows arunachala shivam means the non-moving form of shiva who gives release from bondage a runa runa means bondage so aruna means moksha or liberation and achala means non moving shivam of course is the deity the personification of brahman and idu means this am means is so let's go over it one more time karunar navamaik karudakati nalgum aruna chala shivam idam namaste and welcome to the next episode of ananya bhakti this is called ananya bhava why is that what does it mean well bhakti is more than just an emotion it's more than just a sentiment although bhakti is usually translated love it actually has a much deeper meaning than our western idea of sentimental love much closer to an ontological state of being so we're going to go through this explanation coming originally from sadhu om and we're going to explain how this is so and what the real meaning of bhakti actually is the real meaning and necessity for bhakti comes from the fact that we view ourselves as an ego as a separate self the individual ego or mind arises by fabrication imagining itself to be the physical body it sustains its imaginary existence by constantly attending to thoughts or objects other than itself experienced as mine we imagine ourselves to be the ego by attending to objects or otherness this is duality i and the other the self and the objects 
I and mine. But try to understand, this is all imaginary. This is all a fabrication. There actually is only the self. And although various phenomena may arise in the self due to its very nature, these phenomena are temporary, illusory, and non-self. So when we look at them as separate from ourselves, first of all, this is imaginary. And when we consider ourselves separate like those phenomena that we imagine, <laughs> we create ourselves as a subject in relation to those objects. We've been over this several times in these videos in discussing the root sequence, Mula Pariyaya, and how this habitual thought of the self as the acquirer, owner, and enjoyer of separate objects is actually the root cause of the ego, and hence the cause of suffering. So until we get rid of this mind, this imaginary ego, we're going to be subject to karma. And karma is suffering because it causes rebirth with all of its attendant miseries. So let's go further into this. When we turn our attention away from all otherness towards our essential self, the mind subsides, losing its existence as a seemingly separate individual entity. This is Atma Vichara, self-realization. So Ramana gives us this process of Atma Vichara to reduce and finally eliminate the imaginary duality that creates the ego. And this self-realization means the end of all suffering. And it's also the uh, essence of bhakti, bhakti bhava, and in this case, ananya bhava. Our true nature is not thinking, doing, having, or knowing anything other than the non-dual self as pure, self-conscious, absolute being. And of course, all the gurus teaching Advaita tell us the same thing. So then you might ask, well, why didn't the Buddha talk about the self? That's because the Buddha's method of exposition was fundamentally different. He used negative logic via negativa. And instead of talking about the self, he talked around the self. And we've discussed this uh, strategy extensively in our series on apophatic antifragility. It's one of the main reasons why the Buddha's teaching is so uh, robust and stable. And even though it's been dragged through so many tragedies and difficulties, it remains very effective if you follow it right. So take a look at that. And then we'll continue to discuss on the via positiva or the positive understanding of the self. Therefore, we can realize our true nature only as much as we give up identification with our constantly thinking, doing, object-knowing, acquisitive mind and willingly surrender to the self. Now, how can you surrender to yourself? <laughs> Well, right now we're rebelling against the self. We are distinguishing ourselves dualistically from our actual self. To us, in a state of dualistic consciousness, the self appears as another, especially when manifest as the guru. Therefore, for us, surrender to the self means surrender to the guru. 
The guru, Ramana says, is always the same, although he may speak through different bodies. And he's never the body that you see in front of you. Uh, he's always different. And this is why mental contact with the guru or a deep understanding of sympathetic vibrations is really the best way to approach this teaching through silence. The reason we think and know objects other than ourselves is because of desire. We love to do so. And we love it because we wrongly imagine that we can obtain happiness by owning and enjoying them. I love my car. Uh, I love my iPhone. <laughs> I love my friend. I love my parents, my children, my this, my that. Uh, my this and my that. Well, who is this I that loves all these things? See, this is why to translate bhakti as love is a mistake. Because actually, bhakti is not exactly love. By love, we usually mean lust, desire. And the sentimental emotion based on our desire are either our satisfaction of it or our dissatisfaction, either our frustration or our enjoyment. But this is not really bhakti at all. And it can't be applied to God because God is actually the self, not a separate object at all. So to translate bhakti as love of God is really a misnomer and it leads people to a wrong understanding, thinking that they can enjoy God just like any other object, when actually God is really our self. The struggle to obtain the objects we desire to enjoy and their inevitable loss are sources of suffering. Indeed, individual existence is temporary and miserable because we split off from and deny our real nature, the self. So this very existence as an ego is suffering. Why? Because we split ourselves into subject and object. We divide ourselves into self and non-self. And what we think is our self is only the ego, is only a fabrication of the mind. And as I said, we've explained this already in detail when we speak about the Mula Pariyaya. So I'm not going to go into that in detail here. You should already understand this and watch the other videos before you go on. Nevertheless, we cling to individual existence and do not want to give it up because we mistakenly imagine it is a source of happiness. This is our problem. This is why we suffer. It's very easy to understand this teaching of Advaita. It's very easy to realize the self. As Ramana points out, the self is already realized. Because if I ask you, do you exist? Of course, you'll say yes. So that means you are self-aware. To be self-aware is the symptom of Brahman or the self. Therefore, you are already the self. You have always been the self. The only thing missing is right view. As soon as you get that right view, you immediately realize, I am the self. Aham brahmasme, tattvamasi. But people don't want to accept right view. Oh, they may verbally acknowledge the teaching when they hear it, but they don't really accept it within themselves. And that's why they continue to suffer even after hearing this wonderful teaching. So how do we practice in such a way that we come to surrender to the real truth and realize this teaching ending our suffering? 
Therefore, we will not surrender our thinking mind and abide as our true self-conscious being until we thoroughly understand that happiness does not exist in anything other than our real self. That's why the life and the world is full of suffering. That's why there's frustration. That's why there's anxiety. That's why there's fear and anger and struggle. Because we're trying to achieve these desires, which are fundamentally impossible. How can we enjoy something that is separate from ourself? It's always going to be different. It's never going to be the self. That's why the Buddha says the three characteristics of the world that create suffering are impermanence, uh, unsatisfactoriness, and non-self. So because of these three characteristics, we really can't enjoy living in this world as a separate ego. And that is the incentive for self-realization, to end this suffering. But we simply have to be able to give up our attraction for and our obsession with living as a separate ego and surrender to our actual self. By such surrender, our love, just to be our real self, will become greater than our desire to think of, know, or possess anything else. Cultivating this surrender and the unconditional happiness it brings is the purpose of bhakti. So bhakti is not sentimental love, but it is an ontological transformation at the deepest level. That is why I think it's a mistake to translate bhakti as love. Because this ordinary love that we have for these different objects in the world is not going to transform us. Indeed, it's going to entrap us further in a network of karma and rebirth. And that's suffering. So, if love brings suffering, how is it really love? It's certainly not bhakti, because the object of bhakti is to get rid of this suffering. How? By transforming our understanding of what we are. To succeed in our efforts for self-realization, to surrender our false individual ego and be our real self, we must be consumed by overwhelming love for our true self-conscious being. We went over this in the first video. You cannot let go of ego by making an effort because effort is the ego. To make an effort, you have to divide yourself into subject and object and then push against that object to try to change it or transform it in some way. So the very idea of effort assumes the existence of the ego, of a separate self. Therefore, we cannot attain the self by any amount of effort. And all you guys out there who are uh, claiming to be Advaitins and are following some form of meditation, which is an effort, you're never going to realize that way. And that's why Osho, among many others, especially the Zen teachers, say that the effort has to drop before the realization can occur. And we agree. But what's missing, but what's missing in those teachings is bhakti. The idea that when the effort drops, one is swept away on a tsunami of loving ecstasy and forget all about the ego and the individual self. And you're simply <laughs> swept into this love relationship with the real self and ultimately realization of complete identification as the self. 
That's self-realization. The highest bhakti or devotion is, therefore, perfectly non-dual love for our real self or essential being. So this non-dual love cannot come about as long as the ego exists. As long as the mind is there, there's going to be duality, a distinction or definition between I and other, between subject and object. That has to go away. That has to be dissolved in love, ecstasy, bhakti. This is called bhakti bhava. So you see, it's much more than love. And that's why this episode is called bhakti bhava or ananya bhava. Because bhakti bhava being the general term, ananya bhava is the term describing the specific type of bhakti based on non-dual consciousness. By the strength of such ananya bhava, the attitude or conviction that God is not other than ourself, being, abiding, or remaining in sat bhava, our natural state of being, which transcends all bhavana, becoming imagination, thinking, or meditation, is alone para bhakti tattva, the truth of supreme devotion. This is a wonderful <laughs> verse and a wonderful translation by Sadhu Om. So this bhakti bhava or ananya bhava is much more than simple sentiment, although certainly sentiment is involved. And we're going to go over all those sentiments of bhakti in a future series called Rasa Tattva. But it's actually a change in our state of being. That's why I said it's an ontological transformation. It has nothing to do with an emotional transformation. That's just a symptom. Yes, the emotions will happen. The ecstasy will come. And that ecstasy will wash us away <laughs> down the river into the ocean of bhakti. So let's dissect this term, ananya and bhava. Ananya is a compound of an, meaning not, with anya, meaning other. Well, that's clear enough, not other, right? I am the self. But bhava is a very complex term, which is used in many different ways as spirit, emotion, manner, sentiment, God, existence, thing or substance, the sense conveyed by an abstract noun, contemplation, reality, coming into existence, prosperity, acquisition, world, occurring, instruction, appearance, truth, state of being, dalliance, coming to be, place of birth, behavior, feeling of love, attachment, way of thinking or feeling, meditation, existence, mental attitude, etc., etc., etc. This is only the first page, and the definition is five pages long. <laughs> so bhava is a very high-level, multi-ordinal term. In other words, its meaning changes radically depending on the context. But you'll notice all of these definitions have to do with becoming or coming into being or being in a certain way. It's an ontological term. So being, feeling, having a concept or idea, transformation, and becoming are all intimately linked. You cannot separate them. And that is why, for example, in the uh, process of becoming that we talked about so many times. This uh, fabrication is the basis. 
and from the fabrication, everything else arises step by step. So in this way, you could say that bhava is the fundamental fabrication in any sequence of becoming. I'll say that again. Bhava is the fundamental fabrication in any sequence of becoming. And since what we want to become here is to remain at one with our real self, Ananya Bhava is this concept or idea of being one with the self. Bhagwan says, since God exists as Atma, our real self or essential being, Atma Anusandhana, self-contemplation or self-attentiveness, is Parama Isha Bhakti, supreme mastery of devotion to God. So you see, bhakti in Ananya Bhakti is not really love. Rather, it is the perfection of Atma Vichara, self-inquiry. This is what we're getting at when we say that bhakti is not mere sentiment. Certainly sentiment is involved. But that, that's not what bhakti fundamentally is. Bhakti, at its root, is becoming who we are and have been all along and stopping the imagination that we're something else. I'm going to stop here <laughs> because we're already almost out of time. And in the next uh, episode, we're going to go into... Well, if the question, if actually we are one with God, then why does Bhagavan talk in many of his verses as if we're separate? This is a very good question. Uh, and of course, in Bhakti, Bhakti begins from Vaidhi Bhakti, and then it matures through Raganuga Bhakti, and then reaches its perfection in Ananya Bhakti. So how is it that if the ideal or goal of bhakti is to realize the oneness with the self, how is it that we begin by considering God as being separate? So with that, I'll leave you till the next episode. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung. Karunar Navamai Karadakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam